Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to this For the Love of Art webinar. We're really excited about the artist we'll be speaking with today. I'm sure many of you are already familiar with him. He's a portraiture artist, and he spent 12 years as an instructor in the drawing and painting program at the Florence Academy of Art. And he now has his own online courses teaching oil painting, watercolor, graphite, charcoal, anything you, you name it, he's done it. Um, so thank you so much, Stephen Bauman. I said it wrong, Bauman for yeah. taking the time with us today. I said, I knew I was going to say it wrong. <laughs> um, That's like Michael... you psych yourself out a little bit, you know? That's where like I... positive self-talk. That's where you're going to go, <laughs> I'm going to say it right every time. I can say it in my head over and over and over and still actually it'll, say it'll it wrong. Still come out, it'll still come out wrong. <laughs> so yeah. Michael Ginsburg will be see speaking with Steven today. And if you've joined our webinars before, you're probably already familiar with Michael. He's a co-founder of Legion Paper and created several papers you might already be familiar with, including the paper Stephen uses for his work, which is Stonehenge. So I'm gonna to toss this over to Michael and Stephen to get started. Thank you, thank you, Paige. <clears throat> thank you, Paige. And Stephen, thank you for you know, being where you are, which is six hours from where we are, you're in Norway. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for taking, you know, taking the time to do this with me. Um, I really, really appreciate it. Um, what, what is interesting, and I, and, I, and I threw this out at you before we went live. Um, Paige, you're still on screen. Yeah. Okay. Um, I threw this out at you uh, before we went live. The pandemic has, God knows, it, it has affected so many people negatively, mm -hmm. and in some cases, obviously, positively. Mm -hmm. I mean, reading a little bit about where you are situated and, and what you're doing, you literally have a total working video studio. I mean, in, in, no in Norway, tell us, tell us a little bit about that and your reach. Yeah, that's uh, it was a little bit of a kind of pre pandemic thing, right? So I, I feel like a lot of us are going to be starting to like assess our lives in a pre and post pandemic kind of with that mentality, looking at it. I, about three years ago, I started thinking about doing online classes previous to that, like all my education was like so analog, like old school classical drawing and painting. It doesn't really lend itself to like the tech era, right? So <laughs> there's a lot of sort of Luddites and people maybe not interested in tech. I had some latent interest in it. And about three years ago, I started just grabbing my cell phone and I got a little mic boom to like put it in front of my canvas while I work just to see, you know, what, what, what would happen if I started filming this stuff and, and going online and reaching out to that audience. And um, that was two years previous to pandemic. Pandemic comes along by that time. My wife and I had been doing this for a while. We would both like left our jobs at the academy to pursue this full time. And so when we eventually got like stuck in our one bedroom apartment in Jersey City, uh, we had like all this like filming equipment, like, you know, several cameras, lights, soft boxes, all this different stuff, editing equipment. Wow, really? And we just, you know, for lack of having literally anything else to do, we just made more and more and more videos. So um, eventually we were able to like leave there and come to Norway and expand. Of course, we have a larger space than a one bedroom apartment now. So I have like a proper film studio. My wife actually has also a smaller one upstairs too. So, um, and, you, and your wife, like, your wife is an artist as well. Uh, yes. an amazing one. Yeah. Yeah. Cornelia yeah. Maria Hannes is her name. Uh, you can find a website out there on social. She's Cornelia Hannes artist on Insta. And, um, yeah, I mean, we started actually at the Florence Academy in 2004, the same day. We didn't start wow. until 2007, but that's another uh -huh. story too. <laughs> Now you 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 are a what we we know as a classical uh, portraiture, you know, in terms of doing, you know, the classical, you know, I'm I'm not going to say emulating, but you know, you have obviously a leaning towards, and I'll mention just a couple of names: Sergeant Casas. I mean, uh, am, am I a little bit in in the right area in terms of uh, your your style and, and your uh, your images? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that, you know, there's kind of the, I have to take this back to a previous moment to yeah. answer that, I guess. There was a time where like getting a proper education to be a portrait artist would have been really, really, really profoundly difficult. Probably right around like 1985 through 95. I think maybe there was like two places in the States that you could have gone 
to study with people who had bridged the gap in between like 19th century painting and like whatever the current iteration of, of, of portraiture or representational art was in general. By the time I started in 2004, there were like several schools around, but as you can see, like I had to travel from Miami to Italy to get to a place where you, you could get that yeah. education. Now, yeah. because of that, you were subject kind of to the tastes of the schools that were available. And, and I say that because though I took like a really, really maybe classical as education, it's, it's the best name we have for it now. It's not actually classical per se, but let's say a classical education um, where you are looking at a lot of older artists. For myself, you know, I came from a background, you know, where I, I was actually telling you before the, the, the call as well, that I was a graffiti writer when I was a kid. Oh, so wow. I, I feel like I have a little bit, I, have more, I feel like I have more modern taste, but I understand also in, in the world we're living in, I probably look very, very classical. So I would say that I'm a much more, I'm modern among the classical types and I'm classical among the modern types. So right, right, right. Stephen, I mean, obviously in Norway, I mean, I don't know what the model, the live model situation is, but I would imagine that it's not it's not the same as here in the states i mean you you don't work that much with live models or you do certainly not during the pandemic so uh we yeah. we actually my wife and i are we are really sort of uh cautious about it you know uh, mostly because we uh, she has older parents that we we like to spend time with and even though that finally now they have been vaccinated um we we couldn't really like go out into the world and then comfortably go and visit them so mm. We've really been, we've kept our own kind of like self-isolation, honestly, the whole time. Since March 15th, 2020 till now, I still order all my groceries online. We haven't really? gone to a restaurant really? or a cafe. Like we don't really like engage in public like group activities. Um, uh, so you're so, still being very cautious. Yeah. We're still being very cautious. And, and because of that, of course, yeah, we don't have any models in, you know, in terms of like there being a culture of, art schools that work from life and getting models in Norway. Yeah, that's going to be tough. <laughs> do, do you do you feel that not working with live models and doing what you do is a, is a disadvantage at all or, or no? I mean, I feel like I've been on both sides of it. I, I did like, of course, like teaching at the academy for, for 12 years. You know, I spent those 12 years uh, working from life constantly. And um, I obviously think that as an educator, there are things that you get doing that, um, namely being able to discern and understand and get a, a mental 3D model of like the human form working in your mind. Mm -hmm. That's very challenging to do without. But for myself, you know, as an artist who makes commissions and, and, and makes my own work, obviously when I'm doing uh, these tutorials, I work from photographs. If you've been educated one way, I feel like you can go either way. If you have yeah. never spent the time working from life, I feel like it's difficult to be as versatile as you would be yeah. if you had spent some time doing that. You know, I, I've seen a couple of interviews uh, that you've done with a couple of people who are a couple of known interviewers, that, you know, like what I do, I guess, a, a little bit. And you, your comments were looking at a couple of pieces of your art. You mm -hmm. say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet. I'm, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking it's almost as if it's a risk that you, you know, you want to take a little bit of a risk and go a little bit of a bridge too far with a certain piece of art. Do you find it that it, it, it becomes a learning process when you, when you're working on a piece and you, you maybe do go a little bit too far or, or maybe you're just experimenting and, and, you know, you, you kind of bottom line, you're challenging yourself a little bit. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that true? I would I would definitely say that I'm kind of a dreamer slash daydreamer slash uh, you know I, I I just think that as an artist like I was never the um, I was never the one who just wanted to like execute and get it done and then go home and have dinner or whatever like right. I I kind of like to plumb the depths of things and 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 get into the very complicated stuff that that maybe you know where I I kind of lose my way a bit like that's kind of exciting for me. Um, and obviously, you know, you have to have like the proper skills to find your way while you're on that thin ice. But in a way, like it's 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 why it's exciting to me. I think if I didn't if I didn't have that search, if I didn't have that like constantly 
extending road ahead of me, I, I think I'd get bored, you know? So I think yeah, I, yeah, I think I, adventure. I think I would label, I, Stephen, I think I would label that passion, you know? <laughs> sure, there you go. I think I would label that passion. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm passionate about what I do. I mean, you know, I created, as you know, because you use it. I mean, Stonehenge, we could talk a little bit about, you know, I mean, as important as the art is, mm. I mean, I, I personally feel what you put it on Mm -hmm. is so important so crucial and the materials that one uses to you know to not compromise you know their art is so crucial to the yeah. finished piece well, um yeah. and i know i know you agree <laughs> i know you agree <laughs> i mean you've been using you've been using stonehenge i mean talking about substrates you've mm -hmm. been using stonehenge going back to 2004 my god and, and my, my only comment to that, my only comment to that, because you were drawing long before that, mm. is I created Stonehenge. Interesting short story. I mean, I'll just, you, you may no, not I, even know is, I wanted to ask you this, actually, in this way. No, I, was I, mean, like, I wanted to hear the story of it. Well, I mean, what's really interesting is I created Stonehenge in 1970. No kidding. 1970. All right. And, and what's interesting about it, Stephen, is I, I didn't create it for drawing well really for drawing i created it for printmaking yeah for print as a printmaking paper and it was used primarily as a printmaking paper um and then how it happened i i guess it was kind of so many years later i expanded the range and i added shades and tones and warm white and 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 uh, cream and natural and you know and you know and craft but that that was sub that was, it was much later uh, it found its way into mm -hmm. the colored pencil market mm -hmm. because of the, the ability of the paper to take so many layers, mm -hmm. you know, just layer on top of layer on top of layer without blinking. Yeah. And, and, and you are, as a graphite uh, artist, I mean, I, I don't know if how you, what is it about, what is it about the surface of the stone jam? We know it's somewhat smooth. It, it's really, you know, not, it's not a vellumy toothy sheet. Yeah. It's got a very level, smooth surface. What is it about Stone Age that really lends itself to your work? Yeah, it, it's most important, I think, or, or it comes out most easily or is more easily understood in context of like other papers, right? So what Stone Age was when I first started using it in 2004, it was something that was going to be smoother than the Canson Miton that, that was mm. used around that time right and also like way smoother right than the uh the like the roma paper that was used wow so, oh yeah, by the way roma paper is what we used for charcoal and i mean if you're if you're gonna look for like getting like eventually well whatever if you're gonna look yeah. for for like a charcoal paper um you know that you're gonna get deep rich values on you need something like super fibrous but that was never where i wanted to be uh by the way, I also wanted to be using graphite. <laughs> right, right. So, so it was just um, a little bit smoother than Canson, much smoother than Roma. Uh, it had a variety of colors that we, we really liked. But then the next part of it, I, I think I only really understood how to explain much later, right? But the tooth that you have on a paper, you can think about that like a kind of pixel count, right? Like now when I was young, uh, younger, <laughs> hopefully I can still say, um, like I was, Atari had like come out, right? And we were talking like eight bit graphics. So you had like these eight bit like cubes by which you could kind of describe things. And by now we have like, you know, 4K, 4,000 bit cubes uh, by which we can describe things. So the smoother the paper, right? The finer the resolution that you can get. So if you're drawing with graphite on this super like rough, crazy paper, you're never going to get like that super exactly. like fine kind of like tight detail that you want. Yeah, too many, hill, too many uh, hills and dales in the sheet. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the cool thing about Stonehenge, right, is that if you go further down that spectrum, you get to like Bristol paper. And Bristol paper is a nightmare for graphite. I can't tell you, uh, uh, hopefully nobody from Bristol is watching it or whatever, whoever makes it. Well, it's too but smooth. I mean, it's, it's probably way too, too smooth. smooth. You have to work yeah. way too hard to get it. So, so Stonehenge sits like right in that sweet spot in between the rougher papers and, and, and in between also like those way too smooth papers. It has just enough of a kind of pixel count. Uh, nice supple surface. Kind of yeah. Soft and supple surface. Right. Yeah. 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 Now I'm, I'm told that you also tone your papers. You also color your paper. You color the Stonehenge. Yes. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, so like around uh, a few years ago, let's say maybe probably five years ago or so, it would have been six because I was still in Sweden. I started stretching my paper around panels because what I was getting into at the time was what's called like aqueous dispersion. So you're taking, uh, say, pigments like a yellow ochre uh, right. and you're putting it into water, but you're not binding it with like a gum Arabic like you would with watercolor. That way you can like paint it onto the surface of the paper, but then you can erase it away. So if you've ever put water on paper, guess what? It goes just like this. Right. And if right. you're going to make a finished artwork out of that, you need to get your paper flat again. So what stretching the paper does is it ensures that the paper always goes back to that drum type flatness. Now, I didn't, I mean, I was using Stonehenge and so I just used Stonehenge for this. It turns out it's robust enough that it can take like a lot of the crazy treatment that I've given it over the yeah. years. So it's, just, it's a very, it's a very strong sheet. It's a very exactly, strong sheet. Exactly. So I would, uh, I would stretch it. I would, uh, you know, prime it with like washes of graphite or sepia chalk or something, and then kind of do drawings over it uh, after that, um, and that kind of, like I said, opened up like a new like world of possibilities of stuff that you could do. And I, I was just fortunate enough that I had chosen a paper that that could do that, you know. And and you find it you not only with graphite, but you find it very suitable with with charcoal as well. Yeah, it's really good with charcoal. The, the charcoal I tend to use on it. And the, the reason actually earlier I wanted to make a differentiation: uh, vine charcoal and compressed charcoal are going to be two like totally different drawing experiences. When drawing on stone edge, I really like compressed charcoal, and then and, I use. And Oh, yeah, what well, who's do you use? I mean, do you know? There's a lot of different brands that I use. I I haven't to date come to a compressed charcoal brand that I love. Really, really. So I'll just I'll just say that out there, right? Um, <laughs> uh, so without like saying anything bad or good about anybody, I just compressed charcoal. There's a lot of different types. A lot of them are, in my estimation, pretty similar. Now, vine charcoal. That's another story. Uh, nitrum vine charcoal is what you want to use if you're using vine charcoal. And that's right. what I use for like the lightest values and the lightest modeling is I go actually away from the compressed in the lightest planes and go back to like an H hardness from, uh, from nitrogen. I mean, is there anybody out there? I, I can only think of one artist that possibly uses, you know, like a raw charcoal, uh, charcoal. And, and, and what, who comes to mind is, is probably somebody like Longo, you know, where li literally going to his studio is like going to a mine shaft. I mean, literally. I mean, you know, you, I, I mean, Stephen, you have no idea. I mean, uh, you know, years ago when I went to see them, yeah. uh, I, everybody was wearing ma a mask. Yeah. Everybody was wearing a mask because of the, you know, because of the raw charcoal. But yeah. uh, uh, carrying, you know, continuing on, um, you know, um, we're considering, I mean, and the reason I asked you about toning papers, mm -hmm. and this is not etched in stone because, you know, it's, you know, I don't do anything for the market or mm -hmm. for an artist without it really properly being suitable mm -hmm. and everybody saying, you know, Michael, that's a great idea. Let's mm -hmm. go with it. You know what I mean? I mean, a, a, a perfect case is the, the Stonehenge craft paper. I think you're, you're you're a little bit familiar with the craft. Yeah, no, I've done I've done a lot of drawings on crafts. Great when you got uh, like white chalk and uh, compressed charcoal. A hundred percent. Somebody yeah. challenged me to copy the color of a supermarket shopping bag. <laughs> I, you know, and when you're talking about <laughs> Stephen, when you're talking about an industrial product, yeah, you know, like a supermarket shopping bag, yeah. the colors can vary. I mean, I had I had to send my manufacturer five shopping bags, you know, yeah. and, we, and we finally came up with a color that worked. But yeah. we're thinking about potentially coming out, not going to happen tomorrow and maybe not going to happen for another several months or even a year. Mm -hmm. But, you know, with, and it's I'm, I'm just throwing this out to you. If there's mm -hmm. a color that you think might work for the mm -hmm. given the surface of Stonehenge. Oh, yeah, I, I, I like oh, I have the that. answer. I have what the answer. What is answer. it? Sanguine. Really? Yeah. Well, because here's the thing, right? Like you're working in a lot of these like primary dominant light source situations like I am now. And what you have right. basically is these like kind of warm shadows. Now, if you're a graphite artist, the thing that you're kind of fighting against is the fact that like graphite is 
can be a little bit unfriendly to flesh tones. So you do a lot of like, you know, subtle things with like how you're going to tone the paper to kind of get different effects. Now, one of the things that I used to do that was pretty effective was actually to pre-tone the, the paper with a bit of sanguine. That way, when I erased away, there was a little bit like a little bit of warm tone in the light. And in the shadows, that. you could actually maintain this like warm glow kind of emanating from them and then cooling off your shadow edges using, of course, the graphite to darken it. But I would say sanguine. That would be my primo choice. Okay. Is there a certain, well, you know, there can be different casts, different tones of that as well. Yeah. So, you know, I, I might ask you for some drawdown samples, mm -hmm. you know, Stephen Bauman drawdown samples yeah. of the actual color and you can send them to me. Totally. Um, yeah, no, I absolutely will. <laughs> you know, I, that would be cool. That would be cool. Um, yeah. We have, we have a mutual friend that is, uh, I'm meeting with her, by the way, next week. Mm -hmm. um in emily dietrich um mm -hmm. and she is uh, very very excited about the thought of manufacturing using stonehenge into a into a panel into an art panel um and i know that she made some prototypes for you that you've been working on what are your thoughts what do you mean? It's amazing. Like it's the product, it's the product so, that like we've all been waiting for. Now, here's it, the cool thing, right? Because yeah. like as an artist, I love DIY and most things like I actually like to do myself. Now there's things that I cannot do myself. And that is what the 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 Raymar Stonehenge uh, collaboration right as far as I see it is, right? Because you guys are using vac or those guys using vacuum tables to use like a heat activated adhesive that's pH buffered in between their like fine art grade panels and your fantastic paper. Now right. that is the best way to get your paper onto a panel. The close second is stretching it around a panel using staples and all this stuff. Because at that point, the paper will still buckle. It will go back, but it will buckle while you're working. So if I'm right. using like some aqueous dispersion, I'm waiting 15, 20 minutes to like get back to work with really? with the 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 heat activated like uh, vacuum sealed like uh, um adhesion to the panel th there's never any buckling that happens the paper is totally like inert in terms of like how it reacts to water it's perfect now you would use you would use this as not only for plain air but you would use it you know as 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 if you were working in your studio as well oh yeah now, and 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 what about what about fixative would, would it be so it, the reason I say this is because if we're making a panel, mm -hmm. it's obviously going to be the Stonehenge paper on a very hard, you know, uh, whether it be uh, masonite or whether it be a wood product or or plastic. We're not sure yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't even know what she sent to you. I mean, I I, I think it was masonite, a kind of a masonite. Uh, yeah, I think it was their their fine art, uh, fine art grade MDF with like the yeah 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 right back. Consideration of something like that would would allow you to frame it without you know without putting a molding around it right exactly right. That, that was one of the great joys of like starting to stretch my paper was that like i could frame them like paintings and that's also like what you can do when you have these panels of course the ones that raymar make the panels are a lot finer so you don't also have to like make these really deep frames like i was having to do as well um so like i and i think that's really cool also because drawing in a way you know let's be honest in the commercial fine art world, this is, I'm just coming from an artist, drawings are treated a little bit like a silver medal, right? Mm -hmm. The artist would rather have an oil painting from you, partly because I think, you know, there's that element of color, there's that element of impasto, uh, and there's maybe a bigger audience for oil paint. Um, I think though, like it has a little bit to do with presentation and there's some artists right now that are doing great stuff and like to a person, almost every single one of them, it's, it's about like getting it onto that panel as well. So you can present it in this way that's like more substantial. And I really love that about it. Now you work, you know, and then it becomes an issue of sizes and, and, and what, what sizes should we make? You work fairly large, yes? Uh, it depends. I mean, uh, I, I, lo I love a good large project, um, but also like, you know, as a professional, you, you start to, you separate, I separate projects into my dreamer projects and my practical project. For mm -hmm. practical project, I'm probably not gonna go over like a 24 by 24 for a drawing. 
Uh, if I'm, if I'm, if I, that's just, a large, by the way, that's a large panel. That, that's just pretty big. That's what I mean. Like yeah. most of the work that I would do would probably be like 16 by 16 or somewhere therein, Right. Um, but like the max, the max you're going to see me do like on, on like a, like just a portrait, like head and shoulders kind of portrait. It's going to be like 24 by 24. That's pretty big. Mm. Um, but then like, I'll have like some dreamer project where I'm like, listen, I need to do something that's like enormous. It's 48 by 48. I just need to get special, like custom made, uh, you know, uh, substrates for, for something like that. But if you so, were going commercial, I'd say don't go over like 16 by 16. Well, uh, the thought would be a nine by 12. Yeah. And, the, and the other one would probably be probably 14 by 16 or 14, 14, 14, 14, by, 16, by, 14 like. by 17. 14 yeah, yeah. by 17. Yeah. And not much, lo not much larger than that. Not much yeah. larger than that. And I think that might be an issue from a manufacturing, from a laminating standpoint as well. Mm. Uh, but I'm not sure. I'm yeah. not sure. Um, so uh, something new that's coming in the last quarter of this year, and, and I, I may have mentioned it to you or Paige may have mentioned it to you, maybe not. Yeah. We're coming out, we're adding another product to the Stonehenge family. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you know, in the, since 1970, it, we added a lot of colors. Mm -hmm. um, we added a brother sister, if you will, in, over the last eight, no, it's almost nine years already, we mm -hmm. added Stonehenge Aqua, a yeah. watercolor paper. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know whether you've tried it or not, but um, it, needed, it needed a watercolor paper within the family of Stonehenge mm -hmm. uh, and the, having the pedigree name of Stonehenge, obviously. Yeah. Uh, we also added Stonehenge Black, 100% cotton in a cold press and mm -hmm. in a hot press surface. Yeah. And the reason we did that, Stephen, was because, you know, so many color manufacturers have come out with metallic, iridescent, mm -hmm. pearlescent, whether they be paints or gouache or markers or a colored pencil. I mean, when you think about what color pro substrate to put that on, mm -hmm. black automatically comes to mind. Yeah. And I have to tell you, the images are unbelievable. Absolutely mm -hmm. unbelievable. I'm not sure that whether working on black, I mean, it might be. I mean, you know, for you to try something like, you know, uh, a black, the hot press, the hot press Stonehenge uh, Aqua is really not super, super smooth. So yeah. it might, it might be something that you might want to look at, you know? Yeah, maybe so. It could be interesting. It, yeah, it, yeah. it could be really interesting. I, I'm, I'm not sure what you would be using on it. Maybe a... I think actually when I, when I first think of black, the thing that I would think is that I've, I've been planning this series of like um, oil portraits actually um, that, that are all like, like kind of deep, deep tonal pieces. Um, and yeah, like I think doing those actually on, I think that'd be interesting on a black ground. Well, you, you, but you just, you just segued into, into what yeah. I was... Well, I know, I didn't mean to steal the you, just seg you just segued into what I wanted to really tell you. Yeah. Um, in the last quarter of this year, Stonehenge Aqua, you know, that came out nine years ago and the black came out about maybe three or four years ago, were mm -hmm. coming out with Stonehenge oil. Yeah. So now it, it, it'll be a kind of a, not, not a very hard cold press surface. It'll be a kind of a, a, a softer, you know, version of cold press. Mm -hmm. And it'll be, um uh impregnated an impregnated sheet uh so it will not the color will not bleed through the back side of, of of the sheet and it'll be also be very very heavy it'll yeah. be heavier than 140 pound watercolor paper it'll be a 320 gram well, a like 320 that. gram and um what's what's great about it you know talking to and i'll ask your opinion yeah. just imagine now that you don't have to gesso yeah. a sheet you know, you don't, you don't have to put any gesso on. Yeah. You can, and, and you don't have to get that very hard gessoed feel to the sheet. You mm -hmm. have a soft, supple oil painting paper that mm -hmm. will not bleed through to the backside. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts? I, I love the idea also because it sounds like you're going to make a good oil painting paper as opposed to some of the other oil painting papers that I've seen. Well, um, yeah, well, yeah, it, so that it, makes it, me it's, very happy. <laughs> it's going to be, it's not going to be, it's not going to be hot press. It's not going to be smooth, smooth. Yeah. It's going to have a little bit of a texture to it, but it's going to be, I, 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 you know, I'm really looking forward to, and, and I will get you, 
obviously I'll, I'll get you out turns of it, you know, when, when they yeah. become available, because yeah. I'm curious to have your feedback on it. But I, I, I just... one, one, one group that's going to love that actually is like uh, atelier students, right? Because a lot of times, you know, you're, you're working in the atelier, you've got like limited space to like store things, but you need constantly a supply of like lots of canvases to work on because let's say you have like a two hour evening session with a, a model where you're going to be doing a sketch. You know, I mean, either you're going to have to like tape up a piece of linen, which is always really awkward, or you're going to be right. stretching up a whole pan uh, a canvas to do it. And again, like that's just going to like, maximize the amount of space that you have to take having like a pad wow. of like stonehenge oil painting paper being able to rip one of those off tape it up to your board and like actually paint on something nice this is the other the other terrible thing that happens with students is that in order like because they have this problem of like space and 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 time and the necessity of needing like a lot of canvases constantly is that they'll go like like really low quality because that's like what's available right you know right to use. but right. Stone and, and, making and, one, you don't have an excuse to like not use a really good oil painting paper for your for your drawing or for your well, uh, I mean the, the 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 beauty of this Stephen is that it's going to be 100% cotton. Yeah. I mean it's going to be totally archival. Mm. <clears throat> it's not going to bleed or leach through linseed oil or any of the oil resins, mm. you know, to the reverse side of the sheet. Mm. Um it, it and we're putting it uh not only in, in 22 by 30 sheets, mm -hmm. but we're also going to be make it available in a pad format. That's perfect. And we're also going to be make it available in a roll format. Ooh, I like and that. in a roll format. And uh, we'll see if I can be convincing to Emily uh, that maybe she can, you know, put it on a panel. I mean, I do, I, you know, when that'd you be, think about that'd it, be crucial. I think that'd be that great. would be amazing. I think that would be absolutely amazing. You Let know, me ask you a question about it and put you on the spot. Yeah. Are you going to be offering toned versions of this? <laughs> Please. Uh, Please well, do the toned. You got it. You got to do the toned one. Well, you know, you're gonna have to. You're gonna have to share information with me and and yeah. tell me, Michael, this is what I think would do well. I mean, look, I have to lean on you, yeah. you know, to give me a little bit of guidance. I mean, it's almost like having a focus group in in every single medium that we manufacture product for, whether it be printmaking, whether it be palladium platinum printing, whether mm -hmm. it be etching or mesotint or aquatint or silkscreen. We have, and colored pencil, obviously, and, and now graphite with you. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't, I won't bring a product into the market. Mm -hmm. You know, I listen to the market as I listen to you. Mm -hmm. I listen to the market and I really won't bring anything out that is not, as I call it, press proven. Mm -hmm. You know, that really is, that really works. It really works. Let me and, give you the uh, elevator pitch here. Let me give you the elevator pitch, right? This is the pain point that you're hitting with toned paper that is made for oil painting. Mm. In oil painting, right, you have very often uh, what you want to put on your canvas before you actually start painting, several days before it, so it's dry, is something called an imprimatura. Now, I just use the Italian because I learned to paint in Italy and that's how we called it. Right. It's just like basically a first thin wash of like, say, a raw umber, or like a mixture of umber, a little bit of black to kind of cool off the temperature so that when you actually paint your lighter tones, you're painting lighter than the imprimatura and your shadows are darker than the imprimatura. Now, if you're selling something also like in this situation, our, our target you know, audience here, right? Students and oil painters that want like a good quality surface and want it ready like yesterday, they want to pull it off the pad, have that imprimatura already on it via the tone of the paper. Wow. That's right. the elevator pitch. <clears throat> uh, and do you have do you have certain tones that you can share with me? Obviously, in terms of color wise. Sure. I think you'd yeah. want to do one warm, one cool. Okay. Like so, one that's going to be like a cooler one that's going to set off warm flesh tones, and then a little bit uh, a little bit of a um, but yeah, a cool one to set off warmer flesh tones, uh, and a warmer one, uh, you know, because like a lot of you know color situations that you're going to paint it eventually. Maybe you want a warm background for that. <clears throat> As of right now, given. The nature of manufacturing paper, mm. it is, it, it, it's, it's not just press a button, Stephen, as you know, <laughs> it's not press a button and all of a sudden you have a uh, hundred sheets at the end of the machine. Yeah. You know, it, there, there are minimums, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know minimums uh, that, that have to be met with manufacturers. So it's, it's something to be considered and something that uh, you, you'll share with me you know, going sure. forward. You know, Paige, 
Uh, have, do we have any questions? Yes, I was just going to interject. So we do have some questions and Stephen, I'm sure you get a ton of questions about different materials that you're using. So someone is asking about, I know you kind of mentioned this before, but using smooth paper, they mm -hmm. find it hard to get um, deep, rich values on a smoother paper. Do you find mm -hmm. those difficulties too? It's, it's really about like how you're using the materials that you have, right? So naturally when we wanna make darker values, you're gonna use like a softer lead to do it. I think the biggest problem that people have with a smoother paper and getting rich dark values without getting that burnished shiny look is they're not using sharp enough pencils. If you watch like any of my like online lessons, like one of the main themes that you see, and it's the comments that, that, that people will make all the time, is that I'm sharpening my graphite out like this much from the end of the pencil uh, using sandpaper to get like a super tight conical tip or alternatively using like 0.3 millimeter mechanical pencils with like a two or four B lead. At that point, you can get deep like saturated darks, both without getting that shiny burnished look that you get when you use like a really dull pencil to do it and press really hard, uh, but you can also do that on a smooth paper. Also, I just want to say, more often than not, people's control over dark values has to do with their ability to actually handle a unified value, right? So when we go putting value on a paper, right, we're, we're going back and hatching back and forth with a pencil. And there's gaps in between those, uh, those pencil strokes, right? You need to tighten up your kind of movement uh, uh, like north and south. Uh, and keep your lateral movements like just the same speed or whatever. So you need to tighten up actually your application on the on the paper as well. Got it. And we do have another question about well, the pencils. Wait, before, before, let me let me just ask Stephen. Stephen, yeah. as it relates to smoothness of a sheet, and it's something that from a manu from a paper manufacturing that I something that I have to be very careful about. Uh, you you call it uh, you gave a name to it. I, I call it galvanizing, where okay. you know. Uh, you'll have high spots and low spots in terms of the smoothness of the sheet. And from a manufacturing standpoint, when you're calendaring, which is smoothing out the surface of the sheet, a mill has to be very, very careful to avoid having that, that, you know, that trait, having yeah. that galvanized look. And I, I guess that's to your point, to your point. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. And that's again, like with Stonehenge, it's, it, it hits that kind of sweet spot. Right. Like any, any rougher, and I feel like, and I think you're saying like rougher is roughly, we would say galvanized, like more galvanized. Well, it, it, it's, it's smooth and it's rough. It's smooth and it's rough because you're, what you're doing is you're smoothing the paper out between hot rollers. Okay. So as the hot roller has a tendency of glazing, if you will, use that term, glazing mm. spots on the, on the surface. The mm. Stonehenge has a very level, even surface to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've always I've always had that experience with it. And again, it just basically it comes down to like, you know, using the right lead, using the right sharpness of pencil and also making sure that your application has a very even pressure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Paige, I'm sorry. No. Nope. Um, so the other question was about the pencils. And I know I'm going to say this wrong, but have you ever used cone T pencils? Uh, like, con well, you say, uh, whatever, like, you just say it how you say it, it's fine. <laughs> um, Conte pencils are, uh, as far as I understand it, a lot like a kind of compressed charcoal or a compressed sanguine. Uh, so they make a lot of different tones nowadays. The, they'll do like a white chalk, a sanguine, and like something, something roughly black or a black equivalent. Um, I, I've used them. I think they're okay. You know, I mean, just like any pencil, like, it's going to be the combination of various things that you use it with. You know, that's why I was saying, like, I use compressed charcoal or you could use Conte for this if you wanted to, to get like rich dark values on Stonehenge paper. I wouldn't use vine charcoal to do that. However, like on a, on a paper that was more like corrugated cardboard, like Roma, I think you're gonna wanna use like a, a vine charcoal, which is like crunchier and softer and kind of gets into those holes more easily. Yeah, interesting. Um, so it's just about, it's about like horses for courses kind of thing. Like you, you can't just say, Conte pencil is great and then put it on any paper in the world like it's not going to perform the same way um, and just the same thing like with all the techniques that I use you can't also put them on any paper in the world like they're suited to, to Stonehenge and Stonehenge like papers if you can find something that's any equivalent yeah. yeah yeah and I think that you should talk a little bit about your online classes like if you're a beginner where should you start because I do want to post a link to your yeah. online classes in the chat for people to check mm -hmm. out yeah, that's really important, Stephen. Yeah, the um, so all of my classes are are hosted on a, a, a platform called Patreon that just uh, basically allows me to um, 
uh, have monthly subscribers. Um, but the website that you want to go to is stephenbaumanartwork.com. And on that, it'll tell you like how to register for classes, but then it also has like navigation to all of the tutorials that are available. So you have everything from like super beginner stuff, like how to measure proportions, uh, all the way up to like doing a portrait that goes all the way from a graphite drawing to a grisaille painting to a full palette uh, color oil painting, right? Um, so it's really, it's kind of like all levels. And like I said, I've been developing this content for like three years. So wow. the $10 subscription that you pay at, at first, you would get one or two tutorials. Now I have like probably over 20, 25 tutorials, like fully fleshed out tutorials that are available just for that price of subscription. And this is all, this is all on YouTube, I, I would imagine, yes? Uh, well, my videos are hosted on, on Vimeo, um, okay. which is, allows me to have like, security so it's not like available for everybody in the world to uh, uh to see yeah got it but also got like it. by the way i have a youtube channel as well that's stephen bauman artwork where i post like kind of free versions so if i have like a three hour lesson uh then i'll post like a 15 minute version of that like on youtube just so you can get like a feeling for it understand like what it's all about so stephen bauman artwork on youtube stephen bauman artwork.com is the site where you can see everything that's available uh and my patreon page is where you'd actually make a subscription you know, I, I, I watched a couple of, of, of your workshops, Stephen. I have to tell you, 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 you do it with such little effort. And, you know, it's, it's just amazing how it flows. It just, it just blows my mind. I mean, it really does. And, and I, you know, and I compliment you in terms of uh, how you've developed your craft over, over these years. It's just amazing. It really is. Very talented. Right. So, so talented. So talented. Paige, do we have another question? Um, we don't. But something that I was kind of wondering, because I know someone will ask this, but Stonehenge, do you buy the 22 by 30 sheets and then cut them down to size? And do you keep the decals on the sheet or do you cut those off? Usually like uh, up until, you know, this Raymar uh, Stonehenge collaboration, um, I stretch them. So usually like I'll be, I'll be taking those edges off or stretching those edges around the back. Um, also because like most of the artworks I make are going to be different sizes from the size of the sheet that I buy. Yeah, like I can't, I can't keep the edges actually on them. Although they are like really beautiful edges. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Do, do you guys actually ever do like that edge on smaller papers, like, like a 14 by 16 or something? Uh, like, it, it, be, it becomes, you know, to do a do natural deco yeah. like that, Stephen yeah. becomes a manufacturing order. Yeah, I mean, of course. Yeah, what, yeah. You know, the, the, beauty of, the beauty of the Stonehenge sheet is that it tears it, it gives you, from tearing, mm -hmm. it gives you a very, very nice tear decal, you know? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Gives you a very nice tear decal. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so, my, my question to you yeah. is, going forward, what's next for Stephen Bowen? I just planted some strawberries. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess harvesting strawberries. <laughs> No, oh, I mean, but... you know, look, I mean, you, 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 you're, doing, you're doing portraits, you know, without yeah. a doubt. I, and I know you've done landscapes and I know you've done some still lifes as, as well. I mean, wh yeah. wh what does the future hold for you? I'll, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you what the actual, here's, the, here's the, big, the big picture next thing that's happening, right? I just started something uh, called the Atelier Tier, which up until now, like all the lessons that I've made online have been kind of fairly singular with the exception of maybe uh, like that one I told you about where you go from drawing to grisaille to painting. It's usually about working through one project and all the lessons inside that project. Mm -hmm. What I'm starting to do now actually is deciding. So when I went to school, I went through a three year curriculum and I even like added a fourth year of kind of repeating some of those projects at the end, just to kind of figure out all the stuff I wanted to learn. Now that it's kind of like, I basically have an online art school, which for a long time, I didn't really consider that. I just thought, well, I make some lessons, but I have an online art school. And so wow. it's my turn to put together a curriculum. So I'm basically creating like a three-year curriculum that takes students through everything that I did, except formatted in the way that I would have liked to have gone through it. <laughs> Interesting. I'm doing that through Patreon. And it's, I've just completed the, the second assignment or actually we're in the middle of the second assignment. Um, and that's going to extend out for, I'm going to be doing this for another 36 months, probably. Wow. wow. Yeah. That's great. That's really great. That's really great. Yeah. Um, well, look, you know, I, I can't thank you enough. I, I really, this, it's been, it's been, um, it's been great. I mean, it's been great chatting with you, talking a little bit about product, about materials, about, you know, 
the, the pandemic, um, as as crazy as it's been, I mean, I'm 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 glad that it, you know everybody is healthy and well in in Norway with you, yeah. and um, uh, at your workshops, um, I, I I hope that they just keep keep on going, keep on going. Well, and, I really appreciate talking to you guys as well, and and I'm I'm definitely going to push my agenda for Imprimatura on the on the oil painting paper tone. This is officially a campaign that I'm starting. I'm going to go. Uh, get a domain name for it. We're going to get petitions started. Well, you know, I'm going to get, as soon as that product is made, Stephen, yeah. I will get you full-size samples to fool around with, okay? <laughs> and then we will convince Emily to mm. put it on a panel. We'll That's convince Emily do. to put it on a panel. I'm going to see Absolutely. her next week and um, I will send her your regards. All right? All right, Michael Page, it was really good talking to you guys. Mm -hmm.